Hi, I'm Rosalyn. I'm from Upworthy, um, and I will just be taking you through a sort of brief presentation for the next 30 minutes that will sort of touch upon uh, various themes of you know how we approach um, sharing content online, how we choose that content, how we choose to frame that content, um, and hopefully some remotely interesting takeaways for you as well. So, what is Upworthy? Um, we're 18 months, about 90 months old now. There's a team of about 40 of us. Uh, we were there essentially to fill a gap online. Um, so where you know BuzzFeed was sharing cat videos, we tried to fill a gap, which was sharing campaign videos, sharing um, social activism uh, content, sharing infographics about economic injustice, various things like that. We basically tried to make the issues that you all work on day to day um, accessible and um, shareable online. Um, and we try and get as many people as possible. The, our sort of general ethos is to try and get as many people as possible to see these issues on a sort of social space. Um, why I'm talking to you? Uh, we have examples of sort of real life success here and there where we have shared something and maybe it's funded a Indiegogo campaign or um, you know, we sort of see conversations happen online where people have then gone to sign a petition or they've gone to um, open a change their mind about an issue or open a conversation up with somebody about a certain issue. But that's not the core of what we do. So what we do is, to, like I said, to share that information. But um, people often feel like, we read comments where people feel like there isn't, they're not being given enough to sort of make that next step or to make that change. Or they've sort of watched a video that you know, been like, wow, that's fascinating, or I feel really passionate about that cause, but then they've not been able to know where to go next to sort of make some sort of impact they feel. Um, and that's where I feel like campaigners have a great spot to come in and sort of fill that space where you guys have that sort of capacity and that power to sort of channel that emotion into action. And that is where hopefully some of the insights that I give today you can adopt and you can help sort of translate that emotion into some sort of tangible um, step that the audience can take. Um, so as I said, we are arguably missing an opportunity where we can make that change. Um, and what campaigners and media companies like us have in common is that we are both informing the public of a certain issue. But the difference is, Upworthy, we inform and we leave it there. And we hope you know, that people, after watching that video or reading that you know, series of facts in an infographic, they then go and decide to uh, take some sort of step. But your job is to sort of galvanize that attention into meaningful action. Uh, right. So Upworthy, uh, the th three things that we share online, you're probably all familiar with this, but just to sort of glaze over it now. We look for anything that's uh, meaningful about an issue, it's visual, always visual, and awesome. So actually decent content, not just it happens to be visual and it happens to be about a cause. It has to be you know, a really good piece of content. Uh, we don't you know, share long-winded essays. That's not, we, that's not the core of what is really shared online. It's you know, this visual content um, broken down, maybe. Um, you know, something that tells a compelling story, usually, as well. Um, let me go down. Um, think about the last time you shared something online. Typically, it's something that would make you feel something, something that angered you, something that uh, delighted you, I don't know. But that is essentially what we think of every time that we choose a piece of content and the way that we frame it, is that we really tap into the sort of sweet spot, shall we say, this something emotionally compelling about that piece of content. Um, so that's a core of what we typically share online on social media. The headline, yes, the infamous Upworthy headlines, the sort of vagueness typically, or you know, something where it leaves what we call a curiosity gap. Um, and what the style headline means to us is that it's all very well that Google and New York Times and all these other media companies can sort of give the gist of what is in the story in the headline, whereas they think that's just the, you know, they slap on a headline and that's it. We think the conversation starts in the headline. And so when we write, we start the conversation with that headline. That is where we, you know, we want to draw people in. And we put as much effort and time in simply writing the headline alone as we do with the lead, with the, you know, finding the content, with the, what we share on social media. To us, we put as much time and effort into the headline alone as we do with everything else. Um, and the reason we do that is 
we want to be talking to people online. Uh, the language we use is usually how we imagine talking to somebody in a pub, in you know, uh, our friend's house. You know, we, we talk to people the way that we write, the way that day to day I go and sit down on my computer and write stuff to share on Upworthy is that I want to be talking to people as if I'm having a conversation with them, not that I'm you know, just stating a fact or something in the headline. I want to be making it accessible. And the, the way that we see it is that we are the youth's friend. So that is key, I think, especially on social media. The way that we talk in our copy is that we want to be talking to them as if you know, they know us and they, we, we are a voice. And we talk about this thing called voiciness in our copy. Um, because we are trying to sort of break away from this sort of standard headline format and the standard copy, and we want to be having a conversation. So yes, our editorial process is typically write 25 headlines. Um, I can delve more into that into the afternoon session, but the reason we do that is because we feel like some of the best ideas um, come when you really push yourself to think about the ways that you can frame a piece of content, whether you're talking to um, you know, essentially I feel like it, it makes us step out from being quite lazy and it, like, the, the way that we have 25 headlines is some of the best ideas come up on, like, say, the 24th, 25th headline. The more we think about different angles we can position it, different ways we can talk to someone, whether we have a fact in the headline, whether we have, you know, if we're going to have a curiosity gap, which I sort of briefly mentioned before, how big of a gap will that be? Um, and we'll delve more into that into the afternoon session, but essentially that is what we do for every piece of content. This is what spurred us off. This piece is actually the first thing that I saw on Upworthy that made me interested in them. Um, it was simply finding the same piece of content online, but actually rewriting a headline uh, with the company Move On, which you're probably familiar with. Uh, they framed it in that light, and it managed to get 70 million views over the 1 million view. And so that is actually the sort of core of what we do again is that we feel like sort of a simple change in the marketing approach, simple change in the way that you position something online. If it means that we can get, you know, 60 more million people to view a piece of content that's actually worthwhile and that isn't a cat video, we will do that. And that is the approach that we try and think of every time we share something. Um, again, very briefly touching upon we do a lot of optimization on our website. We do a lot of testing. And we wouldn't be where we are Upworthy if we didn't have such a heavy focus in the sort of tech team um, if we weren't so data driven. Um, and then our website actually looks sort of deceivingly simplistic, I think, when you go on it. It just looks like, oh, you put the video there and a couple of share buttons. But actually, what we do, every single thing on our website has been rigorously tested. And so every piece of text on this page has been tested and is important and is there for a reason. We don't just randomly slap on content and hope for the best, um, which is definitely something that we noticed when we actually started testing around. Oh, to quickly touch on this, this is what happens when you do not test all of the copy as well. This is something you see time and time again. I go to a nonprofit's website and it comes up like this. And there is nothing there that makes me want to share that. It's, so it's a bit small there, but it's like, oh, the company logo, that's great. Why, why would you want to click that? Why would you want to share that? Uh, the headline, typically the excerpt is the same as the headline, and it's just like there's nothing there that really draws me in, and it doesn't make me want to share that to my friends on Facebook. There's nothing there that makes me want to associate myself with that. I, I, people go and share content online because they want to feel you know, whether they want to show what they believe in, they want to show that they're informed, they want to show what they're passionate about. And an example like that, I'm just, it'll go over your head. And that, nothing there makes me want to click to share. Example of what I mean about optimization on our website, the tech team did some, you know, serious, rigorous testing of various places that you can put the share buttons, for example. Um, and I sort of touched upon this a little bit in the morning, having coffee, we were talking about how actually simply overlaying the buttons, you know, it's, you can sort of see the steps that we took to move around the share buttons. And actually, the floating overlay links um, improved the number of shares that we had. And we were like, great, OK, that's great. We've managed to test that. We can see how many shares that's sort of gained online. Can we take that step further? Can we try and position it in a new way on our website and see if we can get more shares from that piece of content? 
and we did. Um, and that has a 398% share from simply having the overlay buttons. And that actually isn't hard to implement. And that should be something, little changes like that can make a huge difference. And it did for us and our tech team when they were testing it. If that can get that much more percentage in being able to share a piece of content online, these are changes that should be you know, really looked at and considered by non-profits. If they've got a piece of content, why not test around with various ideas like this, like Upworthy were doing from the start? Um, so yes, always be testing, just to drill that in there for you. <laughs> uh, we prioritize where people live. Um, I find anyway more and more now that I don't go to non I don't go to nonprofits websites. I don't go to theguardian.com anymore. I actually go to Twitter, I go to Facebook. I see what my peers are sharing. I see, you know, maybe I sign up to a newsletter which sort of rounds up the best stories of the day. But typically I don't go to directly to those websites anymore and that is why we prioritize so heavily on Facebook and social media is because that is where people are getting their news from now and that is where we feel like our time and effort is best spent. Um, and yes, just to reiterate that. The share image, I think, for a lot of our social media posts, um, with Facebook Im bigger images now that you sort of see, uh, the growing presence that we have on Twitter or, on, I mean, on Pinterest, and I don't know, I feel like a lot of nonprofits as well seem to think that, um, Certainly from my experience as well, it's that simply by just having, like I sort of mentioned before, maybe the logo or maybe some sort of, I don't feel like there's enough prioritization about how important the share image is, especially when you're scrolling through a Facebook feed like this. And that is what you see. New York Times posts that. It's like, great, that's a New York Times logo. What, what makes me you know, feel like I want to click on that? What is drawing me in when... You know, you have content like this surrounding it. When your friends are talking about something that's engaging, they're posting visual images like that. That's what is going to gain your attention on a Facebook feed when you see things like this. And again, so this is something that we put a lot of time and effort in, is actually we do a lot of testing with images. And I'm going to go into a little bit more about the various types of tests that we run. But this is just a prime example of something I personally like a lot of non like a lot of nonprofits, a lot of news organizations on Facebook. But to be honest, what am I going to be drawn into there? And as much as I may actually be interested in that issue the New York Times are talking about, that does not draw me in. That it's, it's very, it doesn't stand out enough. And that is something, again, that Artworthy has placed a lot of time and effort into thinking about is how can you make a piece of content stand out on your Facebook feed to make it shareable, to make, make it clickable. Right. So something that we ask ourselves every time we choose to write something up and find something, what do I want people to get out of this content? What do I want to, who do I want to reach with this content and what makes this content special? And I think this is a prime example, I think it translates into the campaigning world, is that you should be thinking about these sort of things every time that you post something. You know, your Facebook feed is not an RSS feed or your Twitter feed is not, you know, a standard place to put press releases. You know, you should be thinking about this content, how you want to reach to your audience and not just your audience, how you want to reach people outside of your audience. How do you want to get people engaged that may not necessarily be aware of or be initially interested in your cause and how can you, how can you sort of engage them? And so we ask ourselves this every time that we decide to share something on social media. Um, and I feel like as well, this is, I'm talking about social media here, but this translates across to campaign emails, blog posts. Um, every day you are trying to tell the story of your organization, uh, the people it affects, you know, the shitty politicians that are making it happen. We do the same, but, you know, it's, it's something that where now I feel like people are starting to delve more into talking to their audience as if they're people and talking to them and reframing their content to make it a conversation and not just a megaphone, shall we say. Um, to talk a little bit more about now, this is a little bit delving into our click testing process. So it may sort of look like on the Upworthy website that we just sort of uh, slap on a weird headline and that is it. And we just hope people click it. And we have those annoying pop-ups that everyone loves. And that is about the core of what we do. But actually, 
I'm going to take you through a number of examples of where I've, you know, things that I've shared, the ways I've thought about framing them, and how I've spoken to our audience. Um, we click test a lot, and by what I mean about that is we click, click, click test the percentage of people that click onto the website, as well as we now actually calculate how many people share that content. So it's not just drawing them in through some sort of vague, weird headline with a curiosity gap. We actually calculate how many people now share that content as well, and whether we over-promise and under-deliver. That's a big thing of ours with our sort of curiosity gap. The, so you probably see on our website that we, you click a piece of content in the bottom right corner, a little pop-up comes up with a piece of content. You may also be interested in this, it typically says. That's actually us click testing, and we have a whole sort of back end, which I fortunately can't show you, but I can show you the sort of ways that we approach each piece of content. And actually each piece of content that we share on our Facebook page has probably been tested at least five, six times, um, which may sound like too much or too you know, meticulous in um, basically overdoing it a little bit, but actually it seems to be paying off and we can sort of gauge which headline or which share image is more likely to get people to click onto it. Um, right, let me show you. So this video, um, the first find was, okay, it's a video about immigration reform. Great. And to show you a little bit of an idea about what we do in terms of those headlines, these, this is an example of the 25 headlines that we would write for every single piece of content. Um, so we would write up 25 headlines, um, which I'll delve into, as I said, um, in the afternoon session. And then we will speak to our editor and pick out maybe our top four favorite headlines or something, our four best headlines. And sometimes all 25 headlines might be completely lame and might all suck on our website. But you know, we, we try and delve into our headlines with maybe a curiosity gap, maybe with a question. Always conversational, never just straightforward to the subject line like a New York Times headline. Um, and so then, again, with this piece of content, it was an Amnesty International video, Cassette Boy did a remix of Barack Obama um, saying that Guantanamo Bay had been closed, and okay, that's a really great piece of content. Let's try and write 25 headlines for that piece of content. Um, and we always you know, position it if the video is funny, if the video is um, really serious, then obviously we cater our headlines to the type of piece of content, but um, it's always, yeah, always with some sort of, something that will hopefully draw somebody in. For this find, it was a video about um, child marriage in Yemen, probably not the most shareable viral piece of content that you can think of. Um, but again, um, where is this? Um, to delve into what I mean about our click testing, so we, you know, we would find a piece of content like this, we write up those 25 headlines, then we will pick um, our four favorite headlines. Um, so again, you can sort of see the standard upward with style of a bit of a curiosity gap. And these percentages after are what I mentioned earlier about the little pop-ups with the content on the website. This is the percentage of how many people will click through to that. So obviously the higher percentage, the better. Um, and it's not just it's a case of tricking people into clicking on the website. It's actually, again, like I mentioned, we do look to the share uh, percentage as well. And we see whether, for example, this got a 4.9% click through. Um, Great, that headline's great. If it had a 0.5% share, we know that we're over-promising in our headline. And we know that it's just maybe we need to scale back a bit and we don't want to over, you know, we don't want to trick our audience into thinking one thing, but we want to trick them a little bit. And so maybe, so this got a 4.9% share, uh, click test, and it got a 4% share button, um, then we will know that the headline reflected the quality of that content as well. And, you know, actually was something that people wanted to share. So, um, and this is what the final outcome looked like. Um, again, it doesn't sort of say outright, this is a video about child marriage in Yemen, because at the end of the day, unless you're already interested in Human Rights Watch or already like them on their Facebook page, or you just happen to be interested in child marriage in Yemen, then chances are you're probably not going to click through to that piece of content. And, you know, we get stick for having that curiosity gap in our headlines, but actually if it means that we can get 20,000 people to watch a video about child marriage in Yemen, we will choose to do that. Um, and so, 
This was a video from Save the Children where they had um, Ellie Golden's music video, but it was a series of like really powerful photography of Syrian children. Um, and so it's like, great, that's a great piece of content. How do we want to take this campaign video and frame it to our audience? Um, and so we took a series of, again, I wrote up 25 headlines, and the winning headline was this. And actually, I personally don't think this is tricking our audience into anything here, because I do think that is crucial to watch. I do think it's crucial for the public to see these photos of Syrian children, of these children, uh, child refugees. And so, yes, we have that curiosity gap, but it's still actually... That's, it's tricking people into click in a sense, yes, but actually if we can get people to, again, look at these pictures of Syrian children, um, then I, you know, we choose to run with that. Um, and so the final outcome for that was, lovely, Ellie Golden, what is this music video about? Um, and you know, the excerpt again, the, everything, every piece of copy there, there's there for a reason. We've tested every single piece of that copy. Uh, next one is example, this uh, hilarious feminist makeup tutorial. Okay, that's great. We can frame it as in a hilarious feminist tu tutorial for other feminists. That's great. You're only going to be reaching uh, people online that can associate themselves with being a feminist or, you, you know, that are willing to sort of share that on social media or not sure whether they are feminists or not. Let's, you know, it immediately alienates a large majority of the public if you sort of title it in that way. And we were thinking, oh, this is a really great video. This is actually quite amusing. And so we decided, I decided even, to actually say the makeup tutorial made for both men and women to see. And the reason I shared this example in particular is because actually, through our click testing, simply changing the women and men from ladies and dudes, like a 1% click uh, increase in our click-through rate. And that is just a prime example of something where simply changing two words in a headline can massively increase in how many people click through to that piece of content. And that is what I mean about our rigorous data-driven click testing. Is that is a prime example of where I'm like, wow, simply changing two words has completely transformed how many people can click through and be interested in that. And again, it's still saying the same thing, but it's just slightly rephrasing it, which is why we do a lot of testing. And again, with the images that we share, um, we found various ways, you know, for the last 19 months we've, you know, done a lot of testing and we've sort of gathered a few things, but um, we, for example, we typically know that having a close-up of a face in the second one, this sort of length away, typically clicks better. We don't know why, we've just noticed that as we've gone along and we've tested each piece of content. And that's actually 1% increase through having that image, we wouldn't have known that. And typically, you know, you will just sort of copy and paste an image and put that on Facebook and then hope people click it. But again, we do a lot of testing behind each, uh, each piece of content that we share. Um, and this is a prime example, again, of just something, a slight change. It's still a face. It's still the same thing. But um, if we can get that many po more people to click through and hopefully, you know, engage in the piece of content, then that's something that we work towards. Um, and that was the final outcome for that. Uh, this is a video from the Robin Hood Tax Foundation. Um, it's a video about the Hurricane Sandy aftermath. Um, and, you know, it's fairly, it's, I don't want to say it's completely underreported, but it's not there out in a public space. When I was in the US posting this, uh, it wasn't in the news. You know, it was a year after, and it was barely sort of talked about. I think a lot of it, the conversation was not directed on the people that deserve to be heard, so the people, the actual residents of... Um, that were hit by Hurricane Sandy. And so we're like, okay, so what can we take away from this piece of content that will get people informed and engaged? And so we did a bunch of testing again. Again, the image here, um, I don't know whether it's necessarily, again, the expression of the face or, but each, each image, again, we do a lot of rigorous testing. And actually the final outcome was a headline. If you listen to what these New Yorkers say and you're not angry, you live in another world for me. And again, I purposely chose not to use something like, this is a video from Robin Hood Tax Foundation talking about hurricane, uh, about Sandy victims. You know, I purposely chose not to use that because it immediately alienates a large part of our audience. And it imme immediately just talks to people specifically interested in that cause alone. Um, and I wanted to talk to a wider audience than that. Um, and so that is why I chose that headline in the end. This was a video actually about um, a gang of uh, women in India. Um, this was actually quite timely. 
when the, um, we actually look for content as well that will relate to what's going on in the news as well. So um, this was around the time of the sort of famous um, horrific rape uh, case that happened in India. And I was like, right, I want to find something that, you know, shows, um, you know, empowered women in India. So I came across this gang of women online that go and um, essentially like attack their rapists. And it was fascinating, this short video clip from the news that these actually quite incredible women just, um, they take the law into their own hands, shall we say. And um, it was really interesting. I thought our audience would sort of really um, find it fascinating. And so <laughs> I was quite blunt in my headlines for this. I'm just going to be very upfront. I'm, I'm not going to give some weird curiosity gap here. I'm just like, spell it out. You can't see the percentage on there, but I think this got like 5% or something, click-through rate. And it spells it out exactly. Um, you know, the pink female gang attacked their rapists. And so we do not always have the sort of curiosity gap I talk about. We do a lot of testing. Again, like I keep reiterating there. And we decided that got like three times a click than the sort of vague headline where, you know, these women took the fight into their own hands. What women? You know, what are we talking about? So as much as I sort of say we have this curiosity gap in most of our headlines, we do vary it up sometimes and we do sort of spell it out as it is. Um, so I personally love this gang. And so this is the final um, outcome for that. They were really amazing. <laughs> uh, next piece of content where I did a lot of testing was this was a video um, that showed a domestic violence experiment, shall we say. This guy played the drums incredibly loudly in the first half of the test, um, had a bunch of neighbors come around and complain. And in the second half of the test, he plays a video recording of a woman screaming um, and nobody comes around to complain. And it sort of questions, you know, the level people should or should not get involved, um, should sort of uh, take a stand, should like go to the neighbor, get involved, all of that sort of thing. Um, and it's really interesting, but rather than sort of framing it as a, this is a test about whether people respond to domestic violence disturbances, I decided to frame it in a slightly more unusual way. Um, that actually, yeah, this has our curiosity gap, and this is where I'm like, actually, this, that, that spells it out, what's in the video, um, and hopefully people feel compelled to then click through and watch that video, um, and actually decide for themselves whether they agree with my statement, whether they actually think it's heartbreaking, whether they don't care, but um, hopefully people do care. So that is that. Um, the testing that we did for this as well, actually, um, again, the drastic change it makes with just a simple change of image, um, both from the exact same piece of content, but again, a lot of our testing behind it um, shows that maybe simply having, um, you know, a, a sort of, I feel like the images that do well actually are not only for faces close up, but um, when someone feels like they've just caught something on camera or whether they've sort of seen something that they weren't meant to see. And so these usually far away blurry images can actually do quite well sometimes as well. Um, and yeah, so that was the final outcome for that. This was a find about, um, quickly skim through, immigration video. This was the four, uh, three headlines that I tested. Um, how do you make people, it's really difficult to make people interested in immigration on social media. We found that over time, you know, unless you're already interested in the issue, how do you get people involved or like to find out more? This is the New York Times video, framed it like that actually did really well in testing and was shared a lot because a lot of people I found as well then commented saying, I actually had no idea this was happening or I actually have changed my viewpoint about this. And, you know, we hope that that was because we introduced it in a slightly different way. Uh, again, the share testing of the images. Uh, that was the final outcome for that. This was actually a video. Um, I did some work in, at 38 Degrees in London on their Murdoch campaign. This was actually in Australia, where Murdoch was stomping, having a stomping ground over there as well. And um, this was a campaign video that I worked on. And this was a winning headline. It did like, you know, twice as good as that first headline. Um, and you know, it's a, a lot of content as well. If you sort of say that it's been banned, or if you say it's like they didn't want you to see this sort of frame, then that tends to do pretty well as well. Um, this was the outcome for that as well. Um, and actually, the share text again, um, you can see I've linked it back, because our audience is predominantly American right now. I linked it back to our US audience, still speaking to them, but still speaking to an Australian audience as well. 
Um, and actually, we did a lot of click testing specifically to an Australian audience as well. That's something worth considering whether the campaign is directed to just people in the UK. We've started to just direct our social media posts, targeting them. Um, I'll skip through this because I haven't got much time. But again, lots of testing. This was actually my, the biggest piece of content that I had. I had like six million or so people click on this. Just again, to really hone in on the type of success rate that click testing can do, um, or just trying out new variations. Even if you don't have access to A-B testing or anything like that, um, the simple change in trying out a few different headlines can like double the amount of people that click through to that piece of content. Um, and the exact same for the excerpt for every piece of content, exact same for the image. Um, as I said, you do not need fancy testing tools. Um, I just really want to hone on on that because I know a lot of people don't have access to A-B testing or anything, any sort of tools like that. But what I would just really hone in on is actually if you have powerful storytelling or if you have some really decent content, um, you know, a lot, of a lot of things can hold people back from sharing, whether that's something that they wouldn't want their mum to see that they've posted on Facebook or, um, as I sort of mentioned earlier, people like to feel like they're talking to their friends and saying, I'm informed about this issue or I'm passionate about this issue. Um, and so a lot of what we share is we're very specific about the type of like, emotional draw it can have. Um, examples I've seen in the last few weeks, actually, just quickly on Facebook, this, Zana never shares campaign adverts or campaign videos or anything like that. I actually think this is a really great example. The image really draws you in. The headline is a little bit, you know, a, little, a curiosity gap, but still, you know, it's descriptive enough for me to be like, oh, that's actually, um, you know, something that I'm interested in. But that's, I don't know, that, that, this is a really great example of someone that I can see online that's actually really shaping their content um, to their audience. Um, and again, actually, with this other piece of content, I actually clicked through to this. I was like, whoa, what company? Um, don't be evil. What, what is this? And great, obviously, the very content dependent. They got to use a very cute photo of an elephant, but um, it worked. And I clicked through and I found out it was Google. So, yeah, this is a great example of where I can start to see nonprofits again with Human Rights Watch. I'm a big human rights activist and I follow a lot of studies and reports that they do, and that's great. but. Um, that is probably the most unappealing thing for me to click on on social media. That really does not interest me in the slightest. Um, and you can see where they're going wrong here. You know, the, 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 the excerpt is the same as the share text. Okay, great. What, it, what is in that headline there that's actually, you know, drawing me in there? Maybe if they reframed it like, you know, Russia's Lord and Human Rights Watch. Why? Or something along those lines. Just think about it a bit differently. What... St here is a prime example where they're just talking to the people that are already interested in Human Rights Watch and they're not talking to that wider audience. And yet, here's a great example, actually. Again, a little bit later, uh, maybe they hire someone new straight away or something, but <laughs> this is a great example where I will notice that on my news feed. I will scroll through and I will see that, and that actually did draw me to click through. Um, and that's, yeah, a prime example of a nonprofit that is doing that. Um, so really brief overview, like I've sort of said, Upworthy, we select emotional material, promote it with these heavily tested headlines that ultimately fulfill our mission of trying to get as many people as possible to click through to share this content. Um, and actually, having said all of this, um, this is what works for us now. And the only reason we're successful now is because we test and we are very data-driven but also, we just try new things. It's not even just a case about running about 50 million tests. It's stepping outside of your comfort zone and thinking that maybe it's time to not just be talking to the same people that you always talk to. And we adapt to where our audience go. Um, and we're going to have to adapt. You know, maybe Facebook crashes and burns. Maybe our weird predictable headlines will stop working. Um, you know, maybe we will have to. St maybe we will start adapting to make it more descriptive headlines. But for right now, we seem to be doing okay with what we're doing. Um, and actually, just some takeaways I want campaigners to really think about is to really, what I mean about those sort of right in 25 headlines, that's just one example of what we do, but to really push yourselves to think outside the box with some of your campaign petition signing headlines, you know, really think about who you're talking to or who you want to be reaching. And those sort of three questions that I mentioned earlier, like what is going to draw people in there? Um, Lots of testing, as I said. You do not need to have A-B testing to experiment in any sort of way that you can. Um, whether that's email subject lines. You know, I've, I 
barely click on any of these sort of non-profit headlines, uh, subject lines anymore, because they're just very predictable. They're very, unless they wanted to be telling me something new, then I tend to sort of just don't click them. And that's, for someone that's actually interested in these type of causes, that sort of says a lot, I think. And talk to a wider audience. You're not just talking to people, as I sort of mentioned, already interested in your cause. You're trying to talk to new people. You're trying to talk to where your friends live, which is on social media. And just to really hone in on this, like, you're having a conversation. You're not on RSS feed. You're not just there to blast out your press release on Facebook and then hope people click it. You really need to start really thinking hard about how you want to be presenting the work that you do. Um, and the final thing is, like, as I sort of mentioned, yes, we, you know, we don't just share these like, heart-wrenched, uh, compelling emotional stories. We do share a lot of fact-based things. We do share a lot of infographics and non-video content. But if you are in a position now to be, you know, if you're in a position behind the sort of content creation for your nonprofit or you have an input, I would really suggest, you know, going back and saying, actually, this is something that my editor said the other day, is that nonprofits should be hiring storytellers and not just video uh, producers or things along those lines, because that is what initially draws the people in. And then, so it's that emotional connection first that sort of draws people in, and then it's the facts and figures and the data after which will keep them interested. And so that's something, again, I would really hone in on campaigners. You know, if you are in a position to sort of have any say in the content that your organization creates, just hammer that in. <laughs> Some really decent, compelling storytelling is the core of what we share. And I think that is pretty much my presentation for you. So hopefully that was interesting. Thanks. Thank you.